Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. There are 47 million bird watchers, but there is only one David Sibley. The son of a Yale ornithologist, he has been birding since his childhood in Connecticut. Sibley was only seven when he began drawing birds, filing his illustrations away along with clips about the natural history of each spe species. Sibley merged that encyclopedic knowledge with his skills as a self-taught artist to become one of America's best-known field guide authors. His first bird guide was released in 2000 with the Sibley Field Guide to Birds, a New York Times bestseller. He's also the author of The Birds of Cape May, The Sibley Guide to Bird Life and Behavior, The Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Eastern North America, The Sibley Field Guide to Birds of Western North America, Hawks in Flight, and Sibley's bird, Birding Basics. Altogether, he has sold more than 1.75 million copies of his books. David Allen Sibley. It's great to be here, um, and thank you all for coming out. Um, what a good crowd. Um, but it is the season the season for birding, that's for sure. Um, and I guess you've had a lot of rain recently, so it's holding back the migration. But um, when the warm weather comes in a couple of days, the birds will come flooding in, hopefully. Um, See if I uh, let me test my remote. That's the volume. Nope. Well, I can use this. <laughs> uh, so. Um, most of you are, are probably already familiar with my books. How many of you owned one of my books before you arrived here tonight? All right. Oh, that's so. There's a lot of new, uh, quite a few new people. Well, I will tell you a little bit about my background, a little bit about what went into all of these books, um, and a little bit about what makes the new Eastern and Western guides different from the previous ones from 2003. Um, so. My story starts when I was very young. Um, in 1969, when I was about seven years old, um, I was already um, really interested in birds and drawing. I had been drawing, I, I've always in, enjoyed drawing, and birds were my favorite subject from very early. Um, I started keeping a life list when I was seven. Um, having a father who's an ornithologist probably had something to do with that. <laughs> uh, it meant that when I was five years old and wanted to draw a picture, I, my favorite thing was to pull one of his bird books off the shelf and, and find a picture that I liked. And that's what this picture of a, a duck hawk, what we now call a peregrine falcon, was copied from one of my father's books. Um, so after uh, I, growing up, birding with my father and my older brother, um, and uh, mostly in Connecticut. Um, I went to college for uh, not quite a year, <laughs> and then uh, decided to go bird watching full time. I, I wanted to write a field guide, and there wasn't a college that offered a degree in field guide writing, so I decided to make my own. <laughs> Um, and I started traveling around the country, living in a camper van, um, just watching birds every day and sketching and doing lots of sketches like this, just pencil sketches, um, lots of notes scribbled in the margins. And this was really the, the basis for all of the bird guide work later on. 
the the knowledge that I got from doing all these drawings. Um, and uh, <coughs> so um, I wanted to show a, a series, and I, I hope you can see this okay from the back, that a, it's a series of sketches of northern hawk owl, which is a rare northern species. Um, and I'll show kind of the development of my sketches through the years. So this was the first hawk owl that I ever saw in 1974. I was about um, 12, uh, yeah, 12 years old. And so it, this was in upstate New York. I was, we were on a family trip. We just uh, made a detour to see this hawk owl that was spending the winter there. And um, I did this sketch in the car as we were driving away just to try to capture some of the memory of it, some of the things I had noticed during the observation. And um, for me, drawing, drawing and birding have always been two parts of the same thing. They go together. I don't consider myself uh, an artist first or a, a birder first. It's, they go together. I, I rarely draw anything other than birds. And when I'm birding, I'm always either drawing or thinking about drawing. Um, and the sketching is a way, it's a way of just, um, it, it creates a, a process, or it forces a process of really studying the bird. Um, in order to do a sketch, even a pretty simple one like this, you have to really look at every, every detail of shape and color and pattern to try to translate all of that into lines on a sheet of paper. So the process of doing the drawing is just a great way to, to study, to investigate what a bird looks like. Um, and that was what I really enjoyed, was the process of figuring that out, of <coughs> learning about the birds through drawing. The sketches themselves are, I, mean, I, I kept them, they're all in, in files, and I used them, I'll show you a little later, how I use them when I'm doing the finished paintings, but um, the sketch itself is not as important as the process. So anyway, this is the, the first hawk owl that I ever saw, 1974. Um, and about seven years later, so this is just just after college, just when I was starting my, uh, my independent study in field guide illustration. <laughs> um, this hawk owl was spending the winter in Maine, and I went up, um, went up to see it on this day, and this is the first sketch that I started that first day. Um, and so I'm just, I mean, drawing it takes a lot of experimentation. It's sort of trial and error. You, uh, you look at the bird, you put a few lines on the paper, see how it looks, make some changes, try again, and keep experimenting until you sort of gradually figure out what a hawk owl looks like. So this is the first sketch, and after a few hours and a few other sketches and a lot of watching, um, I'm getting better, learning the markings, learning the shapes, learning how it all fits together. What, what visually makes a hawk owl a hawk owl? Um, I went back three days later and spent another day um, four hours or five hours watching the hawk owl and doing more sketches. And on that day, I started with this sketch, which is, this one alone took a couple of hours. This is the really in-depth study. I was trying to, trying to look at every single part of the hawk owl, every marking, every shape, and put it all on paper. And there's a lot of erasing, a lot of kind of back and forth experimentation all in this one sketch. This is the the end result, this is the, the detailed study of a hawk owl. And what I learned from that allowed me later that day to do a sketch like this, which is much simpler. There are a lot fewer lines. It's just a suggestion of some of the shapes, but still, I think, <clears throat> even better captures the essence of a hawk owl. So through all this experimentation, and watching, I'm figuring out what what's the minimum amount of information that I need on the page to really capture 
the, the essence of a hawk owl. And then um, seven years later, and if this is seven years of full-time watching and drawing birds, and this was a different hawk owl wintering in Maine, um, and I went up and spent a few days there with some friends, and we watched the hawk owl off and on for, for hours over several days, and I did a whole lot of sketches then, and this is one of the sketches. Um, it's not really fair to call this a sketch. This is a, a finished pencil drawing, which I rarely do in the field, mostly because most birds just don't sit still. <laughs> but hawk owls do. They sit still for hours. And you can really aim a scope at one and just work on a sketch and know that when you look back in the scope, the bird will still be there. Um, but this is the sketch. This is actually the last time I sketched a hawk owl. Um, I've seen a few since then, but never, uh, never had a chance to really sit down and study and sketch. But this was really was the culmination of three different hawk owls over a period of 14 years and many sketches um, to learn, to sort of figure out what makes a hawk owl a hawk owl in pencil. Um, and all of that work really became critical when I started to work on the paintings for the field guide. It was the, the pencil sketches were my first source of reference for when I was doing the paintings. And um, I found that the shape of the bird was the most important single thing. If I got the shape right, the proportions, then all the markings, everything else would fit, everything would work, and the bird would look right. But the, if the shape was off even just a little bit, the markings wouldn't fit. I'd have to stretch make the black neck band wider or whatever to, uh, to fit the shape, and uh, it just wouldn't look right. So the, the shapes and, and uh, <coughs> patterns that I worked on in pencil drawings for all those years were really critical to the, the paintings in the guide. Um, so when I was sitting down to do the paintings, this is back in my studio, um, <coughs> I pull out all of my field sketches and notes, try to find all the photographs that I could of all the species. And I was doing most of the, the first round of paintings back in the 1990s before, before you could Google anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't look up photographs on the internet. I had clipped photographs from magazines. I had my own photos, photos that friends had given me, and a lot of books that, were, that had photos. But there were still species that I couldn't find any photos of and had to work from, from my, own, my own notes and sketches, from specimens, from any other information I could gather. But in general, photographs were the main reference for getting all the details of colors and patterns, and the sketches were the reference for making sure the shape was right and the general uh, sort of the sketches of, served as a way to refresh my memory so that when I looked through my series of sketches of each species, I would build up a really good mental picture of what that bird looked like. And I could then use the photographs and, and uh, translate all that into painting. Um, and this is a more, more recent photograph. This was just a few years ago. Um, and I know that because of the big green splotch on the <laughs> painting table. This is from when I was working on the Guide to Trees. Um, <laughs> and everything was green. <laughs> um, so this is a, an example. This is one of the paintings that I did uh, new, a, a new painting adding a new species to the, the big guide. Um, so starting about five years ago, I started working on a complete revision of the big guide, All the Birds of North America, and I added about 110 species to that. Um, this is one. This is Baikal teal. And um, this is what, this serves as sort of a before and after image of what the painting would look like. So the upper image is the shape, the pencil outline that I would sketch on the paper. and. Um, and at the bottom is the finished painting. 
So I'm starting with a really, a fairly rough, but, but um, uh, precise pencil outline um, to get the proportions right and the angles, and, um, and then just a few little marks to guide me to where to put the markings. And I start adding the paint in, in light washes of color and figure out the shape and proportions or fine tune the shape and proportions as I build up the paint. So the pencil outline provides the general guide for the, the big picture shape and proportions and then I fine tune it all as I'm adding paint. Um, and the, uh, the original paintings are much bigger than what's reproduced in the book. The, those sheets, oh, I didn't show those yet, but at each, each sheet of paper, I'll show a picture of some of the full sheets in a minute. Each sheet of paper is about 15 inches wide by 22 inches high, and that each sheet represents a page in the book, and it gets reduced down to the size of the book. So I'm working on these paintings. They're seven inches long. A lot of the small birds I painted larger than life, um, but that made it easier in a lot of ways to, uh, I didn't have to worry so much about precise details or very fine details. I could use a big brush and work quickly, and uh, it didn't matter if I went over the lines by a millimeter or two. <laughs> it would all get shrunk down and, and uh, tighten up in the reduction in the field guide. Um, so what I have here is a series of photographs of one, the process of one individual painting. Um, so this is a sawwood owl, and it's a, a subspecies that's found on the Queen Charlotte Islands off British Columbia, and a, another new thing that was added to the uh, guide two years ago. So this would have started as a simple pencil outline like the teal, and at this stage I've already added several washes of, of color of a sort of orangey-brown and uh, darker brown couple different layers and I've started to refine the shape and the patterns and I'll just run through I think there's four more slides and each one um, I'm just adding each one probably represents um, say 10 or 15 minutes of painting on, on average it took me about an hour to do each painting in the book so um, so if you think of each, each slide represents about 10 or 15 minutes of work um, and I, I just build up the paint over and detail over the whole bird. Um, so I'm just adding a few more details around the eyes and the wings, adding the streaks, adding more details all over. When I put in the finish, finish up the eyes, it really comes to life, but adding more details over the whole thing. And finally, just uh, kind of cleaning up the edges, making the darker parts darker um, and the lighter parts lighter, adding a little little white paint on the shoulder for the highlight. Um, and this is the finished painting, which again, it's, the paintings themselves, if you see the originals, are not particularly detailed. They're, you can see brush strokes, the painting's pretty quick and rough. But when they're shrunk down to a third or a quarter of their original size, um, it looks much more, uh, much more detailed, much crisper in the reproductions. Um, so here are some of the full sheets. These are the actual original um, paintings from the guide. And this was just a couple of years ago when I was going through and looking at every every painting from the original, the 2000 edition. Looking at every painting, touching up a lot of them, making changes, making corrections, um, adding some new images where that was needed. Um, so again, each of these is about 15 inches wide and 22 inches high. And then after the doing all that work to revise the big book, um, in 2014, all the paintings had been touched up, the text was rewritten, the maps were redone, 
all the images were rescanned with the new 2014 technology um, and uh, then it came time to work on the new versions of Eastern and Western Guide um, which took another two years um, it's not as simple as just taking the big book and splitting it in half and <laughs> calling half east and half west <laughs> um, the biggest job for me one of the biggest jobs was figuring out what to put on each page um, first of all which species to put in each book and then um, how to arrange them all um, some species are either common or variable and deserve a full page most species just get half a page some species are very rare in in either region and only get a quarter of a page or sometimes less so figuring out how to fit all that together turned into some a big puzzle like a big uh, game of Tetris sort of where you're you've got a whole bunch of blocks already in place species that have to go in certain ways and then little spaces in between them that you have to fit other things in so trying to find the best way to fit all of the species together to make the best comparisons across facing pages, put related species together, keep them all more or less in order. That was a big challenge. And then a lot of the text has to be rewritten to be customized either for East or for West. Um, and I think of a species like um, sooty shearwater that's found, it's found off both coasts in the oceans in the east, it's the only species of dark shearwater, so identification is pretty straightforward. In the west, it's one of three species of dark shearwaters, and pretty difficult to identify. And it's very common in the west, it's uncommon in the east, so almost all the text for sooty shearwater has to be different depending on east or west. So there was quite a bit of that. It was a challenge just to find all of those, to figure out where the text did need to be changed and customized. And then um, there were a few species. Oh, well, here's uh, the biggest difference, the biggest, probably the most noticeable change. If you're familiar with the 2003 editions of these books, <clears throat> the biggest change is the layout. So um, the original, the big field guide was arranged um, like the uh, like the image on the right, which is the new, these new eastern and western field guides. So each species is in a column. The birds in flight are at the top. The maps are at the bottom. Everything's lined up for easy comparison. And back in 2003, when we were first working on the eastern and western guides, we didn't think it would work to do the smaller books in that format. Um, so we went with the, uh, the image on the left, if you're familiar with the 2003 editions, the, each species gets half a page, but it's divided a, a top half and a bottom half. And it works, but I think it's a, a lot easier to compare the birds in the, in the vertical format. So we did some tests a couple of years ago and figured out that we, we could actually squeeze everything in um, in the vertical layout. and. Uh, so I was really happy to be able to do that, and that's probably the, like I said, the, the most noticeable change between the 2003 and the 2016 editions. Um, but almost everything, or essentially everything in the books has been changed. It's all new, new artwork, new scans, new text, new maps. It's all just reassembled sort of working from the base of the original edition, but it's an entirely new book. Um, and one, one thing that is changed is uh, I added a few more species to these Eastern and Western guides. So there are just a few species now that you'll find in these books, and they're not even in the, the big North American bird guide. Um, one is pintailed wida, which is this, this is the the one species that's added to the Eastern Guide that isn't in the, the big book yet. Um, so pintailed wida, it's, they're, it's an African finch. They're now breeding in Florida. Um, and it'll probably be a long time before they get to Pennsylvania, but 
<laughs> but if you're going to Florida, you might bump into a pintailed whiter, and it's it's a pretty spectacular bird. They're small. They're uh, they're a small sparrow sized, but when the males have their full breeding plumage tail, they're more than a foot long, um, and they're they're actually a brood parasite, like a cowbird. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests, which is bad. But, but the species that they parasitize is another exotic finch, the scaly-breasted munia, or sometimes called nutmeg mannequin. And that was introduced and is now breeding and spreading in Florida and along the Gulf Coast, and also in Southern California. So once the population of scaly-breasted munias got big enough, it could support a population of pintailed whitas. And now the pintailed whitas are there, laying their eggs in the scaly-breasted munia <laughs> nests, and the munias are raising the baby whitas. So it's all like one little uh, happy ecosystem. Um, so anyway, this is the species that is added new in the Eastern Guide and not in the big book yet, so if you're a really big fan of pintailed whitas, you'll have to get the <laughs> Eastern Guide <laughs> or the Western. It's in that also. And there's a few other species, a few other exotic species that are breeding in Southern California that are added to the Western Guide um, that aren't yet in the, in the big book. Um, and I wanted to finish up just by talking for a few minutes about um, some of, well, I guess my, when I started birding, my focus was really on the competition or the, the challenge of the chase, the hunt. Um, it was all about getting out there, finding the species, knowing where to look and what to look for, and, and being able to actually find all these birds. That was the, the big challenge. Um, Later, when I was doing traveling and doing all that sketching, I sh sort of shifted to more of an academic challenge of just learning how to identify all the species and subspecies and different age and sex variations and color morphs. And um, that was my focus for years while I was working on the field guide. And now, I guess I'm maturing my the focus of my interest in birding now is more about learning about what the birds are doing and understanding um, where they're coming from, what they're doing, how their social system works, what they're saying to each other, all those things. And I've been doing some research on some of that, um, and I wanted to pass along some of the amazing stuff that I've learned recently. There's a tremendous amount of information in the scientific literature that is not uh, often not really translated into uh, the birding world. Um, so ruby-throated hummingbird is a, they're amazing in a lot of ways, but um, I wanted to use them as an example to talk about bird vision. Um, birds can see ultraviolet light, so they see a whole range of wavelengths that we don't. 25% um, you know, more colors than we can see. We can't even imagine what that would be like. Um, and like chickadees can tell males and females apart easily because their cheeks are different colors <laughs> in ultraviolet light. Um, they look white to us, but they're actually different under ultraviolet. Um, and birds also see, um, they process visual information a lot more quickly than we do. So. We, the whole movie industry is based on the fact that we can't process images at 25 frames per second or faster. So movies are 25, 30 frames per second, and to us, it, it's a blur. It all blurs together and we see a moving picture. But a bird watching one of our movies would just see a slideshow. It would see a series of still images flicking across the screen because they're processing information that much faster. And when you think about it, that's really has to be essential for a bird like a hummingbird. Um, you see them just diving around, going 30 miles an hour, flashing by a, 
a hummingbird feeder through twigs, fighting with each other, going, going 20 miles an hour, they're, they have to be able to process images that quickly to, to not crash into things, to see where they're going at that speed, at close range. Um, they're, they're processing the images quickly enough to be able to see clearly what's coming at them. And red knots, which are, again, a species with lots of, lots of exciting, really interesting things about them, but I want to talk about their uh, sense of touch. Um, all the sandpipers have very sensitive uh, nerve endings in the tip of their bill, so they're, they're using their bill to feel what's under the mud. They stick their bill in, and they're actually hunting by feel. Um, there was a study on red knots a few years ago that showed that they take that one step farther. Um, whenever they stick their bill down into the mud, it creates a pressure wave, a ripple, essentially, that radiates out from, the, from their bill. And their, their touch, they're, they're sensitive enough to sense the uh, echoes the, that bounce back from things in the mud. So they stick their bill in, the wave, the pressure wave goes out, some of it bounces back when it hits something of a different density, and they get information from that. They can tell how far away it is by how, how long it takes for that to bounce back, um, what direction it's in, and something about the density of it. So they know, they stick their bill in, they know if they're close to a rock, if they're close to a small clam or a worm, they get all that information and their next probe into the mud is directed to know where to go. And then when they actually touch something with their bill, they, they recognize it instantly, grab hold of it, and pull it out. Um, and owls have just an incredible sense of hearing. The barn owl is the one that's been studied the most. Um, and they were found in in the lab, in controlled conditions, they showed that they can catch a mouse in complete darkness, total darkness, with no light at all. There's no way they're seeing the mouse. They're hunting entirely by sound. But they can fly from a perch up um, six or eight feet above the mouse. They can fly down to the floor and catch the mouse perfectly every time just by sound, just by um, accurately locating that sound and the researchers proved that it was just the sound that was guiding the owls when they they put a mouse into the room with um, a dried leaf attached to the end of the mouse's tail so as the mouse moved around the room it made the sound of rustling in dried leaves but the owl caught the leaf not the mouse it was going for the sound <laughs> of the rustling leaf it pounced on the leaf and uh, not the mouse. And that's all pretty amazing, but the, sort of buried in this study <laughs> was the fact that the, the researchers could only get the owls to do this in a room that the owls were familiar with in daylight. If the owl had seen the room and been able to sort of build a, th presumably, build a three-dimensional map of the room in their head, then they felt comfortable flying from the perch across the room down to the floor to catch the mouse. If they were put in an unfamiliar room in the dark with a mouse on the floor, they wouldn't try to catch the mouse because they didn't know what, might, what they might run into on the way. And that suggests a whole different skill, a whole different ability to, to maintain that not just a three-dimensional map, but a very accurate sense of where they are in the room. Um, you, know, you know your, say, your bedroom pretty well. You can get up in the middle of the night in pitch black and find your way across your bedroom, but you might still bump your shins against something. You'd have to put your hand out and feel along the wall to find your way. Imagine floating in midair in your bedroom <laughs> and knowing which way to go and how far to go to reach the shelf up in the corner. That's essentially what the owls are doing. And uh, they must be doing it in the wild, but nobody knows 
if they do, or how big an area they can memorize. If this is a skill that they use to cover um, acres, or if it's a very specific local thing there's, that has not been studied. Um, but it's again a pretty amazing ability that they have. Um, and there's so many things being learned about really common birds. Just um, uh, killdeer is a very common breeding species um, around here. They're probably already starting to nest, sitting on eggs. They nest on the ground. They just lay their eggs on the ground, on the gravel, at the edge of a soccer field or on the edge of a, a gravel road. Um, and they rely on camouflage. The eggs are very cryptically colored and the, the bird is cryptically colored, so they're difficult to see. And they do the, their, their famous broken wing act if you get close to the nest to lure you away. Um, but they're, So they're visually camouflaged, but um, at night there are all kinds of predators roaming around on the ground that aren't relying on sight, they're relying on smell. Um, well, there was a study done recently that found that the, well first, all, all birds have a, an oil gland and they use the oil from their oil gland to preen into their feathers to keep their feathers in good condition. Um, and so this recent study found that the, the oil that um, killdeers and other ground nesting birds are producing during the breeding season is essentially odorless or at least undetectable by mammals. Um, unlike their, the oil that they produce at other times of the year. So they tested this in the lab by putting a little sample of the breeding season preen oil on the floor in a, in a vial and other places, the non-breeding season preen oil, and put trained hunting dogs in the room. And the dogs zeroed right in on the non-breeding season preen oil and walked right past the breeding season preen oil. They couldn't find it or they didn't notice it. So this is something that was learned very recently <coughs> about even a common bird like a killdeer, that they're actually not just visually camouflaged, but when they need to be in the breeding season, their they're scent is camouflaged as well. Um, and that like anything, brings up a lot of other questions, like why don't they use that oil all the time? <laughs> That's a good uh, PhD project for someone. Um, and then continuing on the theme of questions, there are just so many questions, so many things unknown about really common birds, and Chimney Swift is an example. Um, they're probably already already back here in towns, flying around, and they nest in towns. You're going to see chimney swifts every day for the next what, four months. Um, and then they go south. And there, there are quite a few sightings um, down through Central America and in the winter along the east slope of the Andes and the western, western Amazonia is where they've been seen in the winter. But small numbers, not a lot, and nothing like the, the millions of birds that must be going down there. So it's assumed that they all winter there in western Amazonia, but uh, not really known for sure, and one of the possible explanations for why they're not seen in the winter, and not seen very much on migration either, is that they spend those eight months or so, nine months or seven months, when they're not here, when they're not at their nesting sites, they're probably spending all their time in the air, flying. Um, that was recently confirmed for a, a European swift that winters in Africa. They put some um, tracking devices on these swifts so they could follow their movements through the winter and the swifts never stopped moving. They moved continuously all winter long. They're, they're in the air flying for six months, maybe more. Um, and that's probably what's going on with chimney swifts, but nobody knows. It's just a guess right now that they sort of vanish once they 
they leave their nesting sites. And um, uh, a friend of mine in, is in Connecticut is studying them, and and she wonders where they go during the day, even in the summer. They leave. You, know, you see them around chimneys in town early in the morning and late in the evening when they're they're circling the chimneys, or if they're during different stages of nesting, they'll hang around the chimney during the day. But where they go from there is kind of a mystery. And the only plausible explanation, really, is that they're going up so high that people don't see them, up to 5,000 feet, maybe higher, to a, an altitude where we can't really see them from the ground. Um, when it, on a rainy day, you'll see a lot of them down low, but on a typical day, they just sort of leave the chimney and they're gone. Nobody knows how far they fly, where they go during the day when they leave the nest. Um, and so those are just a couple of examples of some of the really big questions that are still unanswered about very common birds, birds that you're all going to see every day for the next few months. And they spend hours every day, the birds are spending hours every day somewhere, nobody knows quite where. Um, and I think that's one of the most exciting and compelling things about bird watching um, that keeps it continually exciting is that there is no end to those questions. Um, and you can, with the, right, with the right question and the right approach, you can really make big scientific discoveries in your own backyard, even with something as well studied as birds. Um, so I'm, uh, well, like I said, happy to see all of you here tonight. It's great to see a big crowd coming out, and um, very happy that my books can help to uh, introduce all of you to, uh, to the birds and help, uh, after introducing you to them, help you along this road towards discovering more about them and appreciating all of the amazing things that they do. So, thank you. Um, now, I have a, I actually have a flight to catch fairly soon, but I have a little, a little time, so I'd be happy to answer questions for a few minutes and then uh, start signing books to make sure we get through all of them, if there are questions. I didn't mean to scare you off from asking <laughs> questions. What advice would you give beginners? Uh, my advice for beginners, um, um, spend some time with the book at home, um, getting familiar with the field guide, um, and just sort of flipping through the pages the patterns of variation in different families will become apparent as you <coughs> browse through the pages. And for a true beginner, just getting to know some of the names like scoters and vireos and gnat catchers, they're, the names are new, but they're all very distinctive birds. And if you can get to the point where you see a bird in the wild and you say, I don't know the name, but I know I've seen it in the book, <laughs> you have identified it at that point. You just need to find the picture. Um, and a really good exercise is to get a local bird list. Um, there's um, a local, local nature center, Audubon chapter, the, the John Hines Refuge has a bird checklist get something like that and go through the book and you can use um, use post-its or a highlighter or little uh, colored stickers and just mark the birds that are common in this area that you can expect to see because the eastern even the eastern guide has almost 700 species in it you're only going to see well only 150 of them are common here or, or ex really expected here. Um, and if just taking a couple of hours to go through the book and mark those species will be a really time well spent for studying, learning those names, getting familiar with where those birds are in the book. 
Um, and the other thing, you can shortcut all of that by just signing up for a bird walk. <laughs> Going out with people who know what they're doing. The first, the first 20, 50 birds are the hardest ones. Once you have a foundation of knowing what, knowing what a sparrow is and that song sparrow is the most common sparrow here and that it's different from house sparrow, which is common in parking lots, but um, <laughs> that's the hardest part. You get those, some of the basics down and then you can start building on that. And bird watchers are always happy to share. As a bird watcher, do you have any opinion? I know recently I saw some um, conversation on the internet about the benefits or the potential harm of putting bird feeders up for birds. Oh uh, yeah, bird feeders that comes up every every year or two. <laughs> Somebody uh, criticizes bird feeding. Um, it's um, it has it has pros and cons, but I think the pros outweigh the cons. Um, the the arguments against it are that it's, well, just essentially that it's unnatural, that, mm -hmm. that you're providing food, um, uh, that you're going to make the birds dependent or make them stay too late, um, and studies have shown that none of that is true. The birds, even, um, even birds like chickadees, some of the most regular feeder visitors are only getting 50% um, or less of their food um, from feeders. They're still spending most of their time out in the wild getting um, real food. Um, and uh, I think the, the benefits are that it helps birds like chickadees survive extreme weather. That was the the one big study that was done found that the, it didn't make the birds dependent. They took down a feeder in Wisconsin that had been, the, been filled continuously year round for something like 10 years, and they took it down one winter, just took it away. So whole generations of birds had used this feeder. They took it away for one winter, and um, the only difference was that during some really extreme weather events, like an ice storm, um, a few birds didn't survive that, that, that did survive a nearby spot where they had access to a feeder. Um, and the real benefit, I think, of bird feeding is just that it connects people with birds. It's just a easy fantastic way. way. Yeah, it's an easy way to see them, but all oh, so many people um, enjoy birds through bird feeding. And uh, I think that's, that's a great thing. So it really doesn't, uh, you need to keep the feeders clean, um, buy good quality food, um, make sure that you're not introducing diseases or, or um, anything like that. But some basic precautions, um, I think bird feeding is uh, way on the positive balance of the scale. Any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, I have a question about digital sketches, which are gorgeous. So without technology or the digital photography or things, wouldn't you get more of the detail of the real bird, whereas sometimes in the sketches you're not getting all the detail? Do I make sense? Yeah, yep. I yeah, mean, definitely. Great, great artwork and all that. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I well, it's by design that the field guide has less detail. Um, I think that the it's the difference between illustration and photography that um, um, I think the best the best illustration um, strips away all of the unnecessary information so that you can really focus on the important bits of information. Um, so sort of like back thinking back to my hawk owl sketches, the I think the the very detailed full full body sketch um, shows a lot more detail. There's a lot more um, kind of minutia of information in that, but the the simple the simpler outline. Um, 
just a few pencil lines, I think does a better job of capturing the kind of the spirit of the hawk owl and not distracting you with all the minutia. Um, if that makes uh, if that makes sense, I uh, I think that the um, the simpler the illustration is, the more it allows you to um, kind of fill in the gaps in your own in your own way. And as long as the illustration gives you the 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 details, the the essential details to to represent that species, um, you can look at the illustration and fill in all the all the other details from your own experience and and sort of um, kind of in a way project your project your own story onto the image where a more detailed picture and especially a photograph is going to tell you a story of its own um, so the photograph is a record of one bird at one instant in its life and there's no way it can be anything else it it shows that bird, it shows the lighting at the time, the, the habitat, the bird's tail is tilted a certain way, its head is tilted, whatever it was doing, and you look at the photograph and understand all of that immediately, and you get a sense of whether it was hot or cold or bright or cloudy. The whole story is there, and the illustration leaves all that out so that you can... Uh, you know, it, it, it will fit any story, any experience that you've just had. That's my, uh, <laughs> my theoretical take on <laughs> illustration versus photography. Um, and yes, there's, there's definitely a value to having photographs of birds um, as a reference for identification. Um, but I think there's, uh, well, both have value. And, and the illustrations, I think, are um, better in a book like this, um, where every species, you're trying to compare 900 different species, um, all in similar poses, similar lighting. Um, you would never get a collection of photographs like that, even in you know, a thousand photographers in a lifetime of photography still wouldn't have the complete set like that, um, but I, by controlling the, <laughs> controlling the illustration, I can do that in this book and make all the images comparable. Is there a question in the front? Marvin, you and you mentioned about the chimney swifts, and we have a purple martin colony that it's been about five years, and we're fascinated because they show up with deck houses. And they're busy during the day when we're farmers, so we're picking and planting, and they're flying around, and then they disappear all day long. And we're like, where do they go? <laughs> where do they? And they come back at night, just like you were saying. Do they fly that high up? They they're could, there, yeah. They're just yeah, purple martins could also go very high. <laughs> and apparently, I'm told that there are a lot of spiders up there, <laughs> the baby spiders, on their silk threads when they go out. They hatch and the spiders, baby spiders go up ballooning on their silk threads and they get carried up way up high. And when they do um, essentially an aerial plankton tow, take an airplane up with a net behind it and see what's up there, they get a lot of spiders. Wow. And so the birds could be up there catching little tiny insects and baby spiders. Thank you. Yep. Um, all right, well, thank you.